Leading from above the line is a philosophy that recognizes five sources of inner power that are crucial and critical for a leadership development. These sources of power are principal consciousness, purpose, emotional mastery, understanding change, and knowledge empowerment. We have been talking to Dr. Theodore Ferguson, who is the developer of the philosophy of leading from above the line, about the sources of inner power. And today, we're going to close the discussion by discussing the final source of inner power, which he calls knowledge empowerment. Now, Theo, we know that knowledge seems to be the most important factor to our leadership. At least this is what people understand it to be. But why have you used the term knowledge empowerment? Yes, we understand the importance of knowledge. And we put a lot of energy into creating an infrastructure for learning, a physical infrastructure and a human infrastructure to give young people knowledge. But we are now discovering that knowledge alone doesn't help us to build great human beings. We need to do a lot more than just give them an, a good education. So you can be intelligent and not great? You could be intelligent and be a fool. You could be intelligent and be without emotional mastery. You could be intelligent and very unprincipled. And what we have, what we're seeking to do is to build a human being that is not only intelligent, but a human being who has a sense of the potential, who has a sense of what is right and wrong, who has a, a, the ability to master the emotions, and who has a, a, a good perspective on the world in which they live. So the empowerment is related to the use of knowledge? It, it, the empowerment has to do with, with not just gaining knowledge to get a certificate, but acquiring knowledge that you can now apply to, the, to your everyday life, the things you do throughout your life. So giving yourself the knowledge to full, so that you can better fulfill the potential that you have. Okay. It, see, we are very oft, we are, well, we live in a world which is um, where the certificate takes priority. I have mm -hmm. a certificate, I can get a job. Not whether or not I have knowledge, I can get a job. But I have a certificate. And really what matters in life is what you know, the knowledge that you know and to what extent is that knowledge helping you to live out your purpose, for example. So the, the use of knowledge and, the, and use of that knowledge for building your competencies. Yes, well, it eventually results in your leadership competency. Okay, but it's, it's an important element in helping you to be able to do the things you want to do or even to understand the world that you live in. You've got to have the knowledge of what's happening so that you can understand it. So, Theo, are we talking about scientific knowledge here? We talk, yes, you can. We're well, not just scientific, but the knowledge that we gain from our conventional education institutions. This is very different from the knowledge of self now. Right. This is what we call worldly knowledge, having a knowledge of um, maths and science and history and geography and and what have you. But do we also give primacy to knowledge that is not um, of the scientific world, knowledge of the religious world, knowledge of the other world? Well, you can, well, yes, but that is also within the, the business of knowledge. Okay? Something you, you study and you take from the external world around you, whether it's from the, from the scriptures of religion or a scientific book, but that's where you gather that knowledge. Self-knowledge, on the other hand, comes from within. That's what we were talking about right. when we talked about principal consciousness and so on. That is a knowledge that we are, all of us come into the world with, but we're sometimes not conscious of that. Right. And that is the self-knowledge. But the worldly knowledge is the knowledge that we pull now from the world around us. That is how, it's a sense, imagine a seed being nourished externally. Mm -hmm. We nourish our seed with the knowledge that around us so that we can grow to become better human beings. And valuing and appreciating all these sources of knowledge. Yes. Including when we chat with someone informally on the street. Of course. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the knowledge that we gain is from informal conversations. You, know. you didn't know something and somebody comes up and shares it to you. Or you overhear it and it becomes new knowledge for you. So knowledge is not about what you gain from going to formal, a formal educational institution. 
But anything that comes to you that is new, anything that you didn't know before, anything that gives you a better understanding of, what, of the knowledge that you have, is, uh, is part of what we talk about here in the context of knowledge and empowerment. When I think of the great leaders, I know Gandhi was an avid reader, uh, as was Mandela, you know. How they were all avid, avid readers. readers. And because, and, but you have to be read smart. You can't read all the literature of the world. Right. Um, There's just too much. But you have, to under, you have to be able to determine what is it that can help you to become a more fulfilled human being, what it is that will help you to live out your purpose. And those are the places that you put your focus, because that is the knowledge that will be, will be of greatest benefit to you as you make your way through life. Okay. And by the way, from what I'm saying here now, you should gather that when you, when you have a sense of purpose, you immediately have a sense of what knowledge is important. Right. And you can now pursue that knowledge. But can you really discount other sources or areas of knowledge? I mean, if you have the, that we should be if aware. you have the time, yes, there's no harm exploring. Right. But there's a there's a physical limitation. Okay. So you got to one of the things you got to learn to do early in life is to determine what is important and what is not, because you can't you can't study everything that is out there. Right. Right. I know Gandhi tended to raise questions, which he then sought answers for. Mm -hmm. uh, my experiments with truth, he was seeking truth. But Gandhi was mostly, it was about self-knowledge, his real mission in life. Self-knowledge. Self-knowledge, and again, as he put it, he strove to see the face of God, to see the beauty of God in him. And okay. he sought that knowledge right on to death. Okay. Yeah. But, at the same time, he understood the importance of other knowledge in terms of the knowledge of the economy of India, which he studied right. and, and recognized that he, he got to do things a little bit differently. And uh, so he, he also pursued that kind of knowledge to help him to do the, the work that he had to do. Right. And let us talk a little bit more about use of knowledge, which is where the world uh, centers all the discussion of innovation on, you know. Um, to what extent should we be using knowledge to make our lives better? But that's the only real purpose of knowledge. The bottom line of it is to help us to live more fulfilled lives. Now, knowledge is there in the world. There's a vast, vast amount of knowledge. But we must have the competences now to acquire that knowledge. Because without those competences, it's like looking at a big heap of sand, but you can't, you don't know which grain of sand is important to you. Mm. But you know somewhere in that heap there's something that is important. But when you have a sense of purpose, when you have a sense of the importance of knowledge in your own life, it gives you a, set, a, a, a focus, and okay. you can now know what to look for, what to explore. Um, another analogy, imagine you go into a library mm -hmm. and that library has a hundred thousand books. Big library, books all over. And you can emerge from that library after two hours of there saying, I can't find anything to read it if you don't know what you're looking for. Right. But if you have a sense of focus, if you know what is important to you, you're going to find more than you can carry out because you, because you know what you're looking for. Right. And hence the importance of purpose. And you see how this emotion, this power yes, source of, sources of power t are tied together? Yes. They all buttress each other right. as we, as, um, to make you stronger. Right. I know Lincoln, for example, was one who had to pursue a different field in politics, had to pursue his knowledge of strategy and politics and so on, you know, as a, as a newly elected president. And he didn't get that out of a university. Right. He had to read widely. Right. And he pursued it with a passion, because he had an interest, he right. wanted to. Right. So knowledge is not always found in a university or college or so. In fact, a lot of the knowledge that we get is outside of that. Edison, who invented the light bulb, he, he dropped out of school quite early, you know. Right. But he was one of high, a highly educated man, because he pursued the knowledge that he needed to help him to become this highly creative individual that he was. That's an important distinction, you know, this schooling as opposed to real knowledge yeah. and pursuit of knowledge and the many ways in which we can yeah. 
pursue this knowledge? And in leading from above the line, it's not knowledge is not about schooling or certificates. It's about getting the knowledge that you need to live a better life. And pursue your purpose. And pursue, uh, so you can pursue your purpose, you can help society to do things. Yeah. And so we teach people how to live in that, in that um, when we do the well, full program. Right. It's all about helping people to learn and, uh, and to empower themselves with knowledge you now that makes them better, give them a real social strength. With your help us to now understand if we are developing these five sources of inner power, what's the profile of the, of the leader that who emerges? is now well developed and has emerged mm -hmm. from this process? Well, ultimately you want um, someone to emerge with a state of mind that allows them to be able to reach out to others, that gives them a sense of purpose in life so they can pursue something passionately, um, that helps them to develop and project an aura that can win the admiration and the respect of others around them. And we have pulled that together in what we call the seven leading positives. What are these positives? Yeah, and it really and this reflect a state of mind. And the seven leading positives are the first of all, all is love. Where as a human being, you are comfortable with other human beings and you can respect and love all other human beings comfortably, free of prejudices and all that sort of thing. Right. Right? So that you can truly work with other human beings despite their differences. Right? And so that is the first of one is love. The second one is is humility. Often misinterpreted for weakness. Hmm. But let me correct that quickly. I'm always amazed that people will look at Mandela and say, What a strong man, what a powerful man, what a courageous man, courageous man. And what a humble man. In the same sentence. In the same sentence. That's right. But that is the humility that we're talking about. A humility that allows you to be comfortable with your humanity so that you don't see yourself as better than anybody or lesser than anybody else. You're just human and you can relate to other people as human beings. So you put nobody down and you don't put anybody up. Right. But you see human humanity for what it is. And that's a powerful, um, it, it's a state of mind that gives you real strength to be able to have that state of mind because that opens the door now for, to work with everybody. And by the way, when you can show another human being respect, respect can be returned. Okay. Because if you don't show another human being respect, how can they respect you? Reminds me of Oprah Winfrey when she said, you get from the world what you give to the world. Beautiful. She said yeah. it beautifully. So you have, to, you have to project it if you're going to receive it. Yeah. Right? So humility is a strength, real strength. Then the next one is forgiveness, as a state of mind. I will not talk about forgiveness here as a, as a transaction. If you if you if you um if you come and beg forgiveness, then I will forgive you. No, yes. that, that's not what you're Or if you here. apologize to me first, then yeah, yeah no. <laughs> this is having a state of mind that allows you to forgive others. They may have done something wrong to you, but you recognize that they've made a mistake, that in that human being, other human being, there is goodness, mm -hmm. and you have, and by forgiving them, you can help them now to bring out their own goodness. So it's not, you heal yourself, at the same time you heal others, and that's right. the power of forgiveness. It lifts you into a better state of mind, but it also helps others um, to, to, um, to overcome their own, whatever the guilt or shame they may have, they may be carrying out of what they have done. Right. Or, or anger or hatred out of what they have done. Right. So that's, the, that's um, the third one. The other one is, another one is having a sense of confidence. Having a, and that confidence comes from knowing that you are spiritually anchored in the world. What do you mean by spiritually? That, you know, our existence is all about energy, you know. We are, not, we are disconnected to the rest of the world through an energy process. We are all connected to other human beings. We are connected to a universal spiritual power, you can, which we can call God, or many other people choose to use other terminologies. 
or are we connected to the environment around us? And so we have that spiritual connectivity and all human beings can sense it. Right. Whether or not they accept God, by the way. You don't have to accept God to do that. Whether or not you accept that bond that we have with other human beings. In fact, we are so tied together, it's not funny. I mean, that little voice that we have, that conscience that we have, it's a spiritual bond that ties all of humanity together, you know. And guides us in our interactions. Right. And when we can sense and recognize the true nature of our spiritual existence, our human existence, puts a smile on the face, you know, gives us a sense of anchor in the world. And what we're talking about here is not religion. Right. This is about you as a human being living in this world. So it's your, your connectivity to animate and inanimate things as well. Yes. Right? And it is out of that that we have that capacity to love. We say all these things are interlinked, eh? mm -hmm. or to forgive and all of that. Out of, out, out of that, um, that sense of who we are as human beings ties us back to. So all these five, the, sorry, the seven leading positives that I'm talking about now are all interlinked. Mm -hmm. right. So that is having a sense of confidence. The other one is contentment. You know, to live in a world in a state of discontent means that you're forever looking for more, you're forever searching for something. And very often you're searching for something in the material realm or you want more power. You, you want more of this, more of that. But does that not contradict uh, when we guide people to say be more innovative, go out and change things, be not content with what you're seeing? Yes, I get that. I hear that criticism all the time. But the contentment is not about... It's about the out contentment in the outer reality. It's not about... We would like love for you to be contented internally. Okay, so, so that you can address with confidence things that are... Right. Okay. So when we talk about contentment here, it's about contentment with your fear. You get, you're employed, you sign a contract, you get a certain salary, be content with that. Don't try to take more than is your fair share. Right. Right? Um, and of course, that's one of the big problems that leads to corruption and all of that. That state of discontent. That's correct. Or there are people you're contented with a comfortable home, right? But you don't have to have a home with um, 20 bedrooms and in it that becomes a burden for most people in time to have to maintain it and keep it going. It takes away from your quality of life. It, it brings misery. You know, in leading from above the line, we make this statement quite often. You, we manufacture our own misery. And that we bring a lot of things into our lives that we don't really need. You know? right. Very often because the neighbor has it or we, for whatever reason to satisfy our egos or sense of power, whatever it is. And we live in that permanent state of discontent. Right? Never finding inner peace and ease of comfort. And, that, and a state of discontent is a destructive state of mind because it drives you to think selfishly. Right? And, so, and it is fed by the ego and all of that. Mm -hmm. So contentment becomes another source of power. Then the other one is, oh, before I leave contentment, let me touch on something that I'm sure our audience will be interested in. In the area of sex, mm -hmm. an area of great discontent across the humanity. Yes. And a lot it of people- the divorce and so on. Yeah. No matter how much they have, how they get, they're still not contented, they want more. Mm. And you know what that does to our society. Absolutely. Right? It, and a lot of the problems that we have in our society has to do with that. We, we are unable to find contentment with a partner. Mm. We need three and four and five and six and seven. Thus manufacturing our misery. Right? Um, and then the other area I want to talk about is contentment with the food that we eat. Okay, the world is destroying itself now. Increasingly obese. Right, because we eat for pleasure. Not for nutritional reasons. Mm. And once we eat for pleasure, then we keep looking for more, eating more food so that we feel good. And we have to break that 
so that we can find contentment um, with what will keep us in a good state of health, right. good physical, emotional, and spiritual state. Right. Right. And the problem to the obesity problem in the world is about us taking control of our lives you know, and finding contentment at a certain level so that when we, when we, um, uh, we don't overeat, right. we don't overconsume. So contentment is a, is a very important state of mind that we must arrive at. Um, the next one is having a sense of hope, sense of optimism. A state of mind that tell you that tells you that you're living in a beautiful world, we can make it better, the future is going to be better. Okay, when you have a, a positive state of mind, you see the world very different. If you have a negative state of mind, you see, then your world becomes a place of gloom and doom. I can link that back to your discussion on understanding change. Right. Yeah. Good. Gloom and doom. I tell folks, if the world is so terrible and you could only expect it to get worse, worse. why not end it? <laughs> you can as well dig your grave right now. Oh my. <laughs> but if you want to continue living, you better learn to wake up and see the beauty of the future. And when you can see the beauty of the world that we live in, it brings you alive. You see yeah. things differently, right? For example, when we do a retreat, our participants come in. We come in all sorts of states. We don't, states of mind. Right. I could look at a group at the beginning and say, well, no hope for this one, no hope for that one. This one, ah. But I look at the group and I say, wow. Our job is to help all of these people to get to a better place. And I have to have a sense of hope and optimism that, that we can do that, that that is possible. And that is what now brings an energy to me to want mm -hmm. to work. Right. So every human being that I, that I meet, I would like to see them in a positive light. Oh, we, we can do it. There's room to, for that individual to become better. And with anything I can do, I try to do it. But, uh, so we have to have that sense of optimism to energize us in this world. Right. If gloom and doom doesn't help us. Agreed. Yeah, not at all. So a sense of hope and optimism mm -hmm. gives you a, a, and you see the state of mind, you're starting to smile and yeah. uh, that state of mind puts a big smile on the face because everything is so positive. Mm -hmm. And the final one of those seven leading positives is having is um, generosity. To recognize that you're not in this world just to take, you have to give your fair share. Contribute back. You have to contribute. Of course, the best place to way to contribute is through your purpose. Right. But even over and above your purpose, wherever you have an opportunity to share, to help, and uh, and help others, is good for you, not just for them, but also good for you. Right. Yeah? And so those are the those are the seven leading positives that we hope when you do the program. You emerge with those seven leading, a state of mind that uh, where those seven leading positives show in your aura, your leadership aura. And that powers you now to leave the, right. the, your legacy behind. And it powers others to want to follow you. Right. Because you are, you're like a shining light. With a, yeah. with a different leadership aura. Yeah. And that is the kind of leadership that we seek to develop with this program we call Leading from Above the Line. Excellent. All right. You'll recognize that the five sources of power work in synergy. Yes. They don't stand alone. Right. So we have to strengthen all five of them. And as we say, they're like the fingers on the hand. You know this hand is strong when all fingers, when all five fingers are healthy. Right. But you know if any one finger here has a little pain, you know how weak the hand becomes. The entire hand becomes weak. Very weak. That's why we have to strengthen all five sources of power now. Right. Um, simultaneously to give us that inner strength to have to be able to make the tough choices in life, to become the human being that we have the capacity to become. And we all have the capacity to become um, great human beings, all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Theodore Ferguson Theo, for sharing this philosophy with all of the people, young people who will be looking at, at the, this series that we have produced. Thank you for making it clear, making it understandable, and providing them with a pathway to leadership development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me and giving me this opportunity. Welcome.